I'd like to discuss freedoms, starting with an example. Suppose my neighbor wants to throw a party. They're going to have a bunch of people over, and there will be socializing, including drinking, and some loud music. It'll go on into the wee hours of the morning. Me, I just want to have a quiet evening in after a long week at work, and to get some sleep at a reasonable hour. The noise and strife of the party is going to interfere with that. The simplistic answer we might hear is, well, it's his property, he can do whatever he wants, as if his freedom too means he can entirely disregard me and my wants. But I don't think that's right, because as much as he should have a right to do whatever he wants on his property, I should also have a right to peaceably enjoy my own property. The noise and strife of his party imposes on me and my freedom to have a quiet evening of rest. So I want to suggest that there are two types of freedoms. The freedom to, a permissive freedom that I may actively engage in, and a freedom from, a right not to be imposed on or hassled by others while they exercise their freedoms. In this case, my neighbor's freedom to have a party is at odds with my freedom from being disturbed by it. So which one wins? I've been reflecting on this for a while, running a lot of thought experiments in my head, and it's not as straightforward as freedom to always winning. In fact, the First Amendment, the very first clause, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, is a freedom from having a religion imposed on us. It then goes on to offering freedoms to, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and freedom of petition. There may be more freedoms to, but the thing the Founding Fathers put first was a freedom from. Since I started looking, I see freedoms to and freedoms from everywhere, usually in opposition. These take the form of one person claiming a freedom to do a thing, and others claiming freedom from the consequences. The freedom to smoke, for example, competes with the freedom from secondhand smoke, or the freedom to bear arms competes with the freedom from gun violence. In any instance, both sides have their claims to freedom, and the difficulty is finding a compromise or balance between the two. I find it interesting to contemplate on this because much of the political polarization happening right now involves people being rigid in these dilemmas. So in this video, let's discuss the different scenarios and see how they shake out. Now with a neighbor's party, some people might be the kind of smeghead who, as soon as the sun goes down, immediately calls the cops and complains. But if this is a rare party, I'm actually not likely to because at some point, some other weekend, I might want to have a party of my own. So even if this one annoys me, I'm likely to tolerate the neighbor's party. They're not vandalizing my property nor endangering me, and although it might not get quiet, the music is gradually turned down as it gets later. Compare that to the college students who rented a house a few doors down a few years ago. They held parties too, but their guests weren't contained in the backyard, instead using their front porch too. Sometimes the guests would wander up and down the street, leaving trash around and vomiting in other neighbor's yards. The music never got turned down until the cops showed up, which was more than once because of altercations at the party. When my neighbor throws a party, I'll tolerate it, in part because of an unspoken expectation that when it's my turn, the neighbor is going to return the favor and not interfere. Years of living here has shown this to be the case, so there really is an unspoken agreement to let each other impose on the other up to a point. The college students didn't participate in that exchange. More than once, neighbors knocked on their door and asked them to keep it down, and though sometimes the music was turned down, it was soon cranked up again. After a while, we gave up trying to find the balance, and calling the cops early and often became the norm for their parties. The rest of our rights to peaceably enjoy our properties won out. But comparing these two situations shows that we don't always defend our rights hard and fast. Instead, there's a gray area that involves compromise, and even the compromise isn't fixed. There's an accounting of how much give and take has happened, and we're only willing to afford so much give without receiving accommodation in return. As far as whether freedom to or freedom from is stronger, I don't think it's either, but instead depends on the time, place, and situation. For example, freedoms over smoking have changed in my lifetime. When I was a kid, the freedom to smoke outweighed the freedom from smoke. So restaurants had choking sections, and if you wanted to be free of smoke, you hoped you wouldn't be seated along the imaginary wall between the sections that was utterly ineffective in keeping the smoke out. About 20 years ago, though, 
the freedom from smoke began to outweigh the freedom to smoke, and injunctions against smoking indoors were put in place in many places. This raises the question of why. One explanation is that understanding of the harms of smoking and secondhand smoke grew in the late 20th century, and consequently, the weight of freedom from smoke overtook the freedom to smoke. But an alternate explanation is majority rule. Up until anti-smoking campaigns in the 1970s, most adults smoked, and thus the zeitgeist was that freedom to smoke mattered more than freedom from a bunch of hippie health nuts. Under this explanation, as smoking declined and non-smokers became the majority, the non-smokers imposed their freedom from on smokers, and laws banning indoor smoking were imposed. Probably, both contribute to the change. There are more people that want freedom from smoke, and the health implications mean that their freedom carries more weight than it would if smoke was just an inconvenience or annoyance. When the change happened, some smokers complained about the erosion of personal liberties as if their freedom to was the only freedom that existed. And this is why I like this freedom from idea. Banning indoor smoking wasn't just taking away smokers' personal liberties arbitrarily. It was adjusting the balance point between smokers' freedom to and non-smokers' freedom from. But let's go back to my neighborhood and look at how inconvenience and annoyance plays in the balance. One of the circumstances that decides whether freedom to or freedom from is stronger is how imposing each side is. One of my neighbors used to have a rusted out, broken down eyesore of a van in his backyard. Then he bought two dogs, which once one started barking, tried to outbark each other and would go on almost indefinitely. The sound of walking to my garage or opening the window for a cool night breeze at night or the sight of somebody walking down the public sidewalk was enough to set them barking. There's a difference between the van and the dogs. With the van, when I stopped looking out the window and did something else, my problem went away. With the dogs, it didn't. To avoid setting the dogs off, I'd have to avoid using my yard and not open my windows, and even then, somebody walking down the sidewalk would set them off. The same person created two different problems, but one of them I could easily choose to avoid, therefore his freedom to keep a busted down van won, but the other was a burden for me to avoid. So my freedom from incessant barking won when I sick the dog warden on him. I didn't do that immediately, of course. I complained to him about the dogs and afforded him time to train them because I knew that going to the city would affect the balance sheet of give and take and trade-offs that we make with each other. And when I finally did invoke authority, he reciprocated by filing zoning complaints about minor yard stuff. The give and take of compromises can instead become the give and take of retaliation. But what if the accounting of give and take can't be balanced? What if you can't escape being imposed on? I think telemarketing and spam email are a good example of this. When I was a kid, telemarketing was super rare, especially cold calling. If the telephone rang, it was important. It didn't matter if you were busy. If the phone rang, you stopped what you were doing and answered the phone. Living in the country, we had an outside bell for which we paid a monthly fee, and still Ma Bell came around sniffing occasionally to see if we had a second illicit telephone, which always turned out to be the outside bell. If I was in the barn and nobody else was home, when the phone rang, I had to run from the barn to the house, because answering machines were unheard of in the 1970s, which was about six rings or 40 seconds at a full run, which was necessary so the call wasn't missed, just to answer the phone. How different it is today. If I'm busy, I won't go into the other room to grab my phone when it rings. It's probably just some schmuck trying to sell me debt consolidation or a new car warranty. All of us long to be free from scam calls and telemarketers. There was always a freedom to harass us in this way, but in the 1970s, business lines were metered by the minute or the call, and long distance was expensive. Phones had to be staffed because there was no automation, and thus there was a cost to mass calling. But now, telecommunications costs are chiefs, auto dialers and robocalls mean they can impose their freedom to be completely obnoxious to the rest of us at almost no cost. And then there's email. Email was great back when I was in college. Then the internet went mainstream and the spam arrived. Various filtering technology has since been developed and people change email addresses whenever a mailbox becomes too contaminated. So today, 
a lot of folks use Gmail. Why? People's desire to be free from spam leads them to the provider with the best spam filters. And Gmails are reputed to be some of the best, so people use it even when the cost may be some of their privacy. But we're starting to see a way to measure abuse when one side's freedom goes unchecked and the other's is entirely disregarded, there's a problem. Sellers push their advertising that none of the rest of us want. They unshittify our communications tools and impose costs on us that we can't escape from. The waste of our time, the frustration they create, the cost of the resources they use, the sacrifices we make to solve these problems. So now that we've got a model, let's ask, what can this tell us about ourselves? We first learn about freedoms too because it's a more active idea. It is the quintessential idea of freedom, that I have freedom to do whatever things I want to do. Freedom from is a more abstract idea because it's a more passive idea. Determining whether freedom to or freedom from wins requires looking at all aspects. The value to the person who wants to exhibit the freedom and the cost that will be imposed on others. And the situation involved. Is it temporary? Or permanent? Is it just an annoyance or is there measurable damage? Is there something that can be done to mitigate the effects? And if so, what is its cost, effectiveness, value, and who will bear that cost? Personally, it took me a long time to understand that both are valid and both are strong. When nightclub smoking bans went into effect in New York, even though I loved the newfound fresh air and being able to come home without the stinking stench of smoke in my hair, the injunction on smokers' freedoms stuck out. It's not until I really considered this issue that I've come to appreciate how valuable my own freedom from smoke really is. But given it took so long for me, I'm not surprised that there's a societal bias toward freedoms too. Contemplating those who only respect freedom too, that is libertarianism. But let's be clear, a proper libertarian will do whatever they want, but also let you do whatever you want. If you want to crap up the neighborhood by opening a dog kennel in your backyard, well, your libertarian neighbor thinks that's just fine. It's on them to solve the noise and bad smells your kennels create. They can install some deodorizers, or put in central air so the windows can stay closed, and buy some earplugs and noise-canceling headphones. This strikes me as an extreme and impractical position but may explain why a lot of libertarians seem to want to live in rural areas. Live somewhere rural enough where you're far away from everybody else, and it reduces the number of conflicts with those who want freedom from the problems you create for them. Normal, sane, healthy folk will recognize that there's a balance between freedom to and freedom from in the social contract, and that flexibility in circumstances and the situation is the social lubricant that allows us to live and work together as part of society. This is especially important for folks living in cities or close quarters. If every time a neighbor held a party, I called the police precisely at 9 p.m. If the volume wasn't turned down, I'd be seen as inflexible and uncooperative, the rigid SOB neighbor. On the flip side, if the neighbor held a rager until 3 a.m. every weekend and I did nothing, I could be described as a pushover. There's a healthy balance between being accommodating and being a pushover. It's difficult to objectively quantify. Learning how to attain and manage it comes with time and experience and varies with each situation. But being a pushover is not healthy. Repeatedly allowing our needs to be ignored wears on mental health and eventually comes out in dysfunctional ways. Lashing out at or threatening offenders when we finally can't take anymore or expressing displeasure as passive aggression, perhaps vandalizing the neighbor's property or possessions. If they suspect on the origin of such a problem, it could escalate into the form of a tit-for-tat retaliation, which is counterproductive to solving the original problem. And if I'm caught, I could end up in trouble with the police. None of that solves the original problem. The best solution is hashing it out with the neighbors, but doing so requires being able to have a rational conversation. Ignoring problems allows resentment to build up, and the more freedoms have been stomped on, the more difficult it is to eventually have a civil conversation to find that solution or compromise. We want to give others some leeway, but not too much. That can be difficult or impossible when people are inflexible or only recognize 
their own freedoms. For example, I'm an atheist. Whether it's quippy signs in front of churches or missionaries knocking at my door, I'd rather be free of religious propaganda. Meanwhile, there's a certain type of church person that would prefer I go back into being a quiet, unobtrusive person living a sheltered life where they don't have to see me and can pretend I don't exist. I have no doubt they think the way I live my life is a bunch of nonsense, which is pretty much what I think of their religion and their way of life too. But in this case, I acknowledge their freedom to put signs on their property and proselytize exceeds my desire to be free of these things. But counterpoint, I expect them to re recognize my right to live my life my way and not try to inhibit me from doing so. That is, I recognize their right to do their religion their way in exchange for them recognizing my right to do my life and religion or absence thereof my way. This is one of my key points and something that's often lost in the polarized, politicized conversations that we have today. It's an abstract variation of the golden rule give freedom unto others as you would have them give unto you. We need to get better at saying it, of reminding our political opponents that this is a two-way street and there's an exchange, a transaction going on here. So I'm going to say it again. I recognize your right to do your life your way in exchange for you letting me do my life my way. There are, of course, restrictions on this. I don't want you going out murdering, raping, or pillaging. But doing so would violate some third parties' rights, their freedom to life, liberty, happiness, and or property. There is no special case here. Where I think things go wrong is with those who place their personal freedoms, both to and from, above those of everybody else. They want their way, and only their way. Anything they don't like should be banned. Their attitude is summed up as, I demand the freedom to do whatever I want freedom from whatever I don't like, and in the face of my freedom, yours don't matter. An example of this is frequently seen when some Christians want to put a manger display on the town green to celebrate Christmas. But then the followers of Lovecraft want to remind us of the coming Arkham Horrors with a display of their own. Jesus is the reason for the season, the Christians say, and rant about Lovecraft being evil and satanic, an attempt to lead people astray of the pure love of Jesus and God. Never mind all the slaughtering, raping, and other horrific stuff in the Bible, because murder is loving and kind when done by God or in God's name. These folks will get bent out of shape if anything is put up to compete with their manger. An angel Moroni by the Latter-day Saints. Anything put up by Islamic folk. A little temporary Buddhist or Hindu temple. A bust of Bertrand Russell with his quote, remember your humanity, and forget the rest. A picture of Carl Sagan and a nebula with some inspiring words about the cosmos. It's narcissistic that these folks want their freedom to put up their display, and they want that to be an exclusive freedom. Only they can put a display on the green, and if anyone else does, it's an affront to them to have to share the privilege, as if sharing the privilege means less for them, like it's a bag of pretzels. These folks don't want equal rights. They want special rights. Perhaps underlying this is the belief that only they know the truth and what is right. Therefore, only they should have freedom to share their message, which they allege is the truth, and have freedom from the rest of the world's message, which they claim are lies. But why should they have freedom from criticism of their beliefs, yet have the freedom to criticize the rest of ours? If anybody has the freedom to put a holiday display on the green, then everybody has the freedom to put a holiday display on the green. And everyone has to exhibit tolerance by setting aside their freedom from those displays that they don't like. The alternative, if you don't want to be tolerant and would prefer to keep others from installing their public display, is to allow no one to install the display on the green. Your freedom from will not be imposed on, nor will anybody else's equally valid desires to be free from these displays. But the trade-off is that no one is able to exercise their freedom too. That, to me, seems fair. In particular, this solution avoids the tyranny of the majority. The dominant group saying that, as the majority, they should have the freedom to express themselves. But as the majority, they should also be free from that which they disapprove of. The minority finds their freedom to restricted, but also their freedom from neglected. Instead of everybody getting one or the other freedom, some people get both. 
while others get neither. This is unbalanced and therefore unfair. I believe in others' freedoms to religious choice and practice. However, I also believe in freedom from religious bigotry. Hence, I believe others have a right to believe and worship however they like, but I disagree with the current trend of sincerely held religious beliefs, basically, but Jesus, being used as an excuse for the religious to refuse others their civil rights. Consider my sincerely held belief that human overpopulation is straining the biosphere's viability and that humans should not have more than one, maybe two children. Oh, but that's not a religious belief, so that doesn't matter. Why is that? If they are both sincerely held beliefs, why should one matter more than the other? Consider the neo-Satanist who feels that it's his duty to pummel Christian homophobes and transphobes about the head until they come to their senses. I don't think that's acceptable, but what if it's their sincerely held religious belief? It seems doubtful the courts would agree. What if a Santeria practitioner has evolved from their beliefs from animal sacrifice to human sacrifice? Murder is illegal, but what if that's now their sincerely held religious belief? I hope that you agree with me that this is no excuse. A sincerely held religious belief should not be a permit for murder. Sincerely held religious beliefs are a loophole that allows the dominant culture to emphasize its freedoms over the freedoms of others. It's a way to put their thumb on the scale, so to speak. It isn't a catch-all, but it tips the scale of freedom to versus freedom from slightly more in their favor. It is a form of tyranny disguised as fairness. This relates also to discrimination because we most often think of discrimination as restrictions on freedoms to. Redlining, for instance, imposed on black people's freedom to buy certain houses, and sexism used to impose on women's freedom to pursue certain careers. I think we've made a lot of progress against this form of discrimination. Take a large enough sample and I'm sure you will find a few instances of minorities running into similar modern day problems. Nevertheless, I think those are rarer than in the past and most people, if they see it happening, would agree it's wrong and discriminatory. But what about freedoms from? In the real world, the dominant culture has long imposed freedom from minorities. Minorities have long been tolerated as servants, but the rest of the time they'd prefer we bugger off and not exist. Usually the majority settles for minorities getting out of their sight, but once in a while their freedom from seeing us get stepped on, leading to lynching, murdering, or some good old fashioned beatings until we remember to stay quiet and complacent. Progress has been made on this front, but not nearly so much progress as has been made in freedoms too. The abstractness of freedoms from makes it more difficult to see or identify these forms of discrimination. Take sexual orientation, for instance. Huge progress has been made in the last 25 years and there is majority support for gay marriage. How often though do we still hear positions like, I don't care what they do, I just wish I didn't have to see it. Those who are willing to grant permissive freedoms to queer folk but still want to retain veto power of freedom from having to see us. Like the manger on the green we spoke about earlier, as long as straight people dating and snuggling and kissing and sex all over the movies and TVs and radio and the internet, then it's fair that a certain amount of queer dating and snuggling and kissing and sex is there too. Now on a side note, I will admit, it feels very contrived at times. Perhaps after the script is written, a focus group or editor looks it over. There isn't any queer representation here. Yeah, well, Bob the Policeman is bi, and um, Alice the Attorney is in a lesbian relationship. There's nothing in the script. Well, yeah, it doesn't really come up. I, well, I can't tell. And so the trowel comes out to queer up Bob and Alice. Being a clumsily written in afterthought, it feels hokey, clumsy, and gratuitous. And I don't like that nonsense either. The alternative is to leave Bob and Alice as low-key queer, but then the queer community complains about lack of representation. Until one or both get outed later, whereupon the right wing complains about pandering. Creators are damned if we do, damned if we don't. Real equity for minorities means not just extending freedoms to to include them, but turning down expectations of freedom from to achieve parity. As we continue going forward, 
we need to recognize that inclusion means more than extending freedoms to, to include marginalized groups. It means not shunning minorities because you want freedom from people who are different from you. That's something we have to choose to implement individually because policies and enforcement can ensure freedoms too are respected, but only you can overcome prejudices and inhibitions you have about other groups. Lastly, if you're the type of person who wants total freedom to do whatever you want regardless of how it imposes on others, you'd also expect to have your freedom froms be fully respected because you don't feel you should have to be imposed on, then understand you're not compatible with living in a multicultural society. You might want to move to a shack in Montana or a similarly isolated location because living here in a community amongst other people of different religions, viewpoints, interests, lifestyles, sexual orientations, genders, ages, histories, some with different work hours, some with families and children, requires a willingness to cooperate, to give and take. You might think that creating a monocultural society, for example, one that is all Christian, would solve the problem, but that's not true because the more unified your community becomes, the subtler the differences and incompatibilities that will keep you at odds. But I think that's a topic for another video. I hope you've enjoyed watching and that I've provided some ideas worth thinking about. This is the point in the video where the host usually asks you to like and subscribe and asks you to leave comments down below. But uh, are 10,000 replies ever really read by anyone? Is there ever a real conversation there? You're certainly welcome to, but instead I would like to challenge you after you've had a few days to think about these ideas and work them through in your own thoughts. Talk with somebody else about it. Have a meaningful in-person conversation. Share your own thoughts, debate what I've raised here, and listen to their perspective too. And don't so much try to win as to just have an interesting, worthwhile exchange of ideas. It's an art we're losing in this age of the internet. Prost and see you off the feedspotten.